Welcome to another figure week, hard surface week, organic week. Hey everyone, my name is Ahmed al -Douri. I'm a concept artist and former instructor at Art Center College of Design, Brainstorm, CCS, CGMA, and various other places. And I would like to introduce to you this digital painting course that I've created. But before we get into anything, I just want to thank you for the support you've all given me this whole time. And with the support of so many of you, I've been able to put together everything I know about painting into this digital painting course. You want to become a pro, illustrator, concept artist, or even just a hobbyist, but you don't have a clear map to get there. And that's where I come in. I spent the last six months compiling everything I know from my 20 years of art practice, and I've turned it all into a map. Starting with foundations such as rendering shapes, color theory, painting basic subjects, understanding brushwork, brush economy, all that fun stuff, deconstructing the skull, drawing it from every angle, all the way to master studies, stylized painting, and you'll find yourself at the end of the course doing a concept art project based on everything that we learn in the first 14 lessons. So how does it work? Well, you sign up, you watch the lectures, do the assignments, post them to the community page if you want, and treat it as a self-study, except for those of you who have signed up for the weekly meeting where I personally critique your work in a virtual classroom setting. I believe learning by repetition is super important. That's what I've sort of presented a lot in this course, and the assignments are tailored for that, as adapted from my time teaching at Art Center. And each of these lessons have step-by-step -step explanations in real time. If you've ever seen my videos, you know exactly how I teach. And this course is intended to be a substitute for a college-level course, but you don't have to pay the four or $5,000 per class, racking up maybe 200K in debt. With my custom design course, you'd be paying a fraction of that. And of course, I also have payment plan options if you don't want to pay for the whole thing at once. Thank you for watching this, and I'll see you soon. Hey guys and welcome all to another episode of digital artcast um thanks for joining us once again on the podcast um i hope wherever you guys are in the world that you're keeping safe and creative as always and uh, i'm hoping that these uh, episodes are soothing and relaxing and something that you can chill with while you're working on your projects or whatever you're doing in the world um guest wise we've had a lot recently and feedback um and uh, different things you guys have been suggesting um i'm always open to hearing what you want to have from the podcast in terms of guests and uh you know subject matters that we talk about if you have anything in particular you can leave a comment down below you can leave any reviews or any feedback you want on the, the sites that we have we're available through spotify google Podcasts, itunes um, and of course youtube if you want to see our lovely faces um and yeah we also have a discord so if you guys want to jump into that um and share your art anything you're working on or just talk amongst other artists then uh, you're more than welcome to jump in and, and join us um another great episode today um, as always, I try to source um, the best people I possibly can for these episodes, and I'm sure I found another winner today. Um, I'm, I'm sure she would agree. Um, but yeah, today we're talking to the lovely uh, Miss Ashley Cassidy. Hey, Ashley. Hi, how are you? I'm fine. I'm doing well. How are you today? I'm doing great and finally enjoying the weekend. So <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, how's the weather in Texas? I'm assuming it's hot. Oh, it's so hot. Like it, it's every year I feel like it's getting hotter sooner. And like even they're saying like our electrical services are like conserve energy. And I'm like, do you want us to boil alive? 
guys, but you know, <laughs> but I mean, you know, it, I've lived in Texas all my life, so you get used to it at some point. So yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> climate change is a motherfucker. So yeah, yeah, yeah. no, it's, it's one of these things. Even like we were talking about Nick earlier, how we've got the kind of common connection there, and yeah, he's he's just a recent patron of of moving down to Texas as well, and he was saying yeah, getting used to the the climate down there is a bit of a shock, but yeah, it's one of these things. Like even when I went to California for a uh, light box in 2019. Um, talking to the guys who live in LA, we're like, yeah, it's you know, 32 degrees and sunshine seems like a great factor, but then when it's every day, <laughs> it's like yeah, eventually yeah. You know, Texas, start to get, yeah. Texas be- definitely keeps you on your toes. Like it'll be one day, it'll be bright and sunny, and then it'll be that night, it'll be like, oh, tornadoes are coming! Like bear down oh, the hatches. Sh- it's like oh, it- and then like all the dads pull out their lawn chairs on the front lawn, like it's some kind of football game. It's just it- it's a it's a <laughs> complete it's a very weird space to live Different in. But- yeah, yeah. I mean, <laughs> but I love we, it. I've lived here all my life, so you know, yeah, you get used yeah. to it. <laughs> no, the same, the same as Scotland. It's one of these things where we can have four seasons in one day. It's, you know, my partner, who's from uh, the Netherlands, originally Holland, so she's Dutch, and she came across here, and she's like, I can't understand your wear system. You know, like in the morning, it'll be like you know, um, soaking with rain, and then like a couple of hours later, the sun's out, and then it's like windy, and then I, yeah, it's just we live on an island in the middle of the ocean. It's just it's how it is. So but, um, yeah, weather permitting. Um, so. Yeah, I mean, the kind of thing we want to talk about today with with what you do, um, you know, with social media, with digital art, with illustration, with, with everything within your creative consciousness. Mm-hmm. Um, if anybody doesn't know who you are, um, you just give a kind of quick intro to who you are and what you do. Yeah, sure. So um, I'm a fantasy digital illustrator and painter. So I have I've been an artist all my life. So my my story, my origin story isn't very different than a lot of other kids. You know, I drew everything and I grew up on video games and whatnot. But um, in college, I actually went for the entertainment industry. So I wanted to at the time wanted to work in concept art or animation, like visual development style stuff. Um, but as I got a little bit older, you know, I, my style kind of leaned more towards illustration and I kind of leaned into that. I also teach as well now. Mm -hmm. And so I teach in combination with taking freelance. And so in the last couple of years, um, on top of just doing illustration, I've really kind of tried to bend into mainly doing what I want when it comes to illustration. So my, if you look at my portfolio, I do a lot of fairies and florals and stuff like that. And I just stick with that. And honestly, that has been the most successful route for me because it's just what I love to do. And you get the clients that want what you do. And so, um, so now like, you know, I'm taking illustration work. I'm working on a tarot deck for um, Llewellyn Worldwide, a steampunk fairy tarot deck and just teaching, living life, you know, and just, um, you know, taking any other opportunities that happen and just enjoying the ride. So, <laughs> yeah. Oh, awesome. No, I mean, I think it's one of these things I've talked about with a couple of artists who've been in the podcast, and it's a whole thing of, I think every student who thinks about the entertainment industry or wants to be an illustrator, as soon as they leave school, it's like, right, I want to go work at Blizzard or Riot Games or yep. EA or, you know, one of the big whatever studios. But then I think as uh, your attitude shifts as you learn more about the industry and as you get a little bit older, you know, you think to yourself, that, well, I mean, what is success to me? What do I really want out of life? Do I really want to go and kill myself working, you know, 200, 150 hour weeks, you know, in yes. massive studios for, you know, no great pay and crunch constantly. And I mean, I'm not saying the games industry is constantly all that. I mean, there's obviously some great stories behind it. But um, yeah, I think people have interviewed at the top tier of stuff, you know, are some of the people who's, regularly suffer like mental breakdown and burnout and um, <laughs> yeah so yeah yeah well that's and cool. that's how it was for me you know because I mean like I, I I'm sure every art kid probably especially like I have more conservative parents that like you know they they supported what I did but like you hear like you should work for Disney and blah blah yeah. blah and like as I got older like I mean when I got out of college mm-hmm. you know that was I was that kid I was like okay like I'm going to get a job with digi di, di- Disney probably yeah. apologies I'm gonna get a job with Disney and like it's gonna be great and I'm just gonna get right in and then it never happened and it was kind of a reality check for me because one of the problems that I faced that I really had to come to terms with and I teach other people other artists this too is like you can't force yourself into a mold you can't just say like if I have a portfolio that looks like every other Disney artist you're gonna get a job at Disney that's not how it works like most art directors they want to see originality they want to see what you do and you know you kind of have to like flow with where you land um but yeah. like you mentioned too the burnout and stuff i mean like i said i don't want to crap on the game industry at all you know because there's some great companies out there that you yeah, know yeah, really totally. respect their employees but mm. i'm very much the type of person where uh you know especially doing illustration like i like to be a little bit more slower paced and mm. i also too like I- i've tried i've done the whole like working 
an extra, I mean, I worked a full-time job and worked an extra 30 hours a week doing freelance and it burnt me right. out. It's like, you know, you have to be very realistic of what your stamina is in regards to art because you want to enjoy art. But if you're doing it to the point where you hate it, it's like, what's the yeah. point of you working in the industry no, anymore? Exactly. Yeah, no, it's, <laughs> if you've not got passion and love for it, then yeah, like people will quickly just, you know, turn the other foot and walk out. And, you know, it was one of these things, I think even just a couple of years ago, it was like, um, you know, uh, I don't know personally his reasons, but I think it was along those lines. But Jamaro Kindred, who was working at Blizzard at one point, mm -hmm. you know, he was famously the guy who had the, the website, I want to work for Blizzard. And that's what got him the job. Yeah. Um, and then like only, you know, a year or two ago, he left only, after only about four or five years there. And we were all totally shocked. We were like, oh my God, I can't believe like he's leaving. What's happening? Um, I mean, he always says it was a great opportunity where he had a second dinner, you know, working on that Marvel game. But, you know, at the same time, I think he maybe you know the the dream of what blizzard could be the reality maybe they didn't match up to what he thought it was so mm -hmm. yeah i think it's one of these things where people always say like oh you know I'd, I'd want to go work for right in blizzard and i'm like that's great that's an aspiration but like those companies you know are like any other job in the world it's a lot of hard work it's a lot of pressure deadlines yeah um so what would you rather have and then i think people always have this thing like oh you know if i if i only done this you know i'd be a failure because i've no made it you know and then you're like well what's making it like there's a whole spectrum of like you know making it in a sense so mm -hmm. yeah, it's good that you've carved out your own path at least that's that's something to be proud of you know what i mean i mean i'm very proud of that and like i teach it just because like i i think it's like the whole i i could beat this into the ground but the big thing i try to lead with is authenticity with mm -hmm. everything that i do and so um like you said it's when it comes to actually like kind of a little bit of a story, I was actually interviewing for a teaching job recently and I got the job, but one of the questions they asked me in the interview, they said, you know, if you had a dream client, who would it be? And I'm sure like, you know, most people would say, oh, Blizzard or Disney or Riot, you know, but I said, you know, I'm actually working for my dream client right now, which it's just this public, this spiritual publishing company where I'm working on a tarot deck, which I never thought I would work on a tarot deck. But the thing is the deck itself, Number one is everything that I love to paint. It's fairies mm. and flowers and like just steampunk element. It, it's just never boring for me. And also too, the clients that I'm working with, they're so laid back and kind where it's like they kind of let me run my own project. Like the only thing they kind of touch base with me technically is, you know, okay, like for printing, you know, making sure things are in right spots. And so I just get to go with the flow and it, it pays great and it's just as easy. And I'm like, that's a dream client. It's not just about the name. It's about, okay, like when you go into the job, are you enjoying yourself? Are you yes. able to be creative? Are you able to pace yourself? And so with some of these companies, like some people go into these companies and like, you know, working really hard and whatnot, it, that's their shtick and, and kudos to them, but don't have the rose colored glasses on that just because they're a big name, it's yes. going to be a huge deal. Like that's why I said about Disney, actually, like mm. I love Disney because for the magical aspect, I grew up with Disney, but I've told people, Oof. um, I will never work for them. You know, yeah. I've actually worked with Disney when I worked at a toy company and it's a whole different beast. And I'm like, I don't want that magic ruined for me. You know? No, it's like the whole thing of like never meet your heroes, right? It's the same kind of thing. Like you don't want to have that whole image spoiled that you've built up in your head that you right. know, this perfect thing that can, you can do no wrong. But yeah, it was even um, just off the cuff, but also kind of related was there's a whole thing in the news right now about Nintendo and how horribly they treat their contractors and employees in yeah. America. Which I was like totally, I wasn't shocked by because I'm like, it's a Japanese company that's yeah. running America. Like, it's obviously they're not going to, you know, I, I've seen how people are treated in Japan who work there and then like it, it didn't make any sense that it was going to be any different in America. But um, yeah, like it was even because we, we were talking about a couple of friends about the, the new story that also broke the guys who worked in Elden Ring. Um, I think their art director was on like the equivalent of like um, like 35000 to $40,000 a year. Oh my like, God. For an art director in like Elden Ring, I was like, "That's unreal! That's, like, that's how does petty. he live?" <laughs> I and never knew that. Tokyo. Yeah, I mean, like it's crazy. So, yeah, it's it's one of these things where people are like, "Oh, it'd be great to work for this person," or that. But then, yeah, it's like you've got to be very. Um, I think the the one thing I learned from some of the bigger AAA guys I talked to is that you can't really a hundred percent have loyalty to a company. Know that you can't work hard and be good while you're there, but like you know, it's you don't need to live and die for the company. You know, you have to take care of you. Exactly. At the end of the day. And that's I, the main thing. Yeah. I think that goes for any job, really. I mean, mm -hmm. um, I tell people like I was it was funny. I have a friend of mine who he's trying to kind of get he's a photographer, but he's kind of trying to build his own business and he's dealing with a client right now. Like he, it's I feel like when you're starting to work in freelance, you know, I I, I hate to say pay your dues, but it does happen a little bit because in the beginning you're kind of getting some bad eggs, you know, because you're yeah. trying to figure things out. And I told him, you know, once you get to a certain point, no amount of money 
is worth you your mental turmoil and you know oh, yeah. emotional. I mean, granted, yes, you have to get paid. Don't get me wrong. But yes. what is it really worth if you're going in and making money, but you're going into some place that you hate? Because at oh, the yeah. end of the day, it's like you show up for a job, you do it, and you come home. And also, too, what is your life outside of that job? You know, because yeah, yeah. you know, artists get our creativity from the world and our experiences. Mm -hmm. But if you're spending ninety five percent of your time sitting drawing, not giving yourself time to live and take in new inspiration, you're yep. kind of, you know, slashing your throat to save your face. It's it's just a whole big mess. So you got to be really yeah. careful when you go into those kinds of things, for sure. Yeah. yeah, we just we just done an interview recently, one of our latest, where we interviewed uh, Esben Rasmussen, who was a splash artist at, at Riot. And he came from Denmark, crossing Europe. And uh, and like, yeah, he had a whole experience before he went to Riot. And the one thing we kind of talked about while he was there was the fact that he was almost constantly burnt out. And feeling depressed and just the whole I think vibe of that whole company and and yeah I, I mean I don't know we didn't get into too much detail about why that really was but like it, it was just surprising to hear that like it was just you know although he loved the job in a sense it was also just the whole thing where the pressure was immense and uh he was like yeah when kids come out of school and want to go work there straight away like you know that's a great aspiration but it's a lot of responsibility to be working alongside like some of the best people in the industry because um, right. then you're having to keep up with everybody else right and you know me to me Esben is an amazing artist and an unbelievable illustrator but mm -hmm. if you're working next to five or six other people who are on his level you know like that's a whole different other thing so yeah, yeah. and I mean I think it, even as hard as we try to like fight like because that's the other thing too I try to teach people or, or young artists like you can't compare and even at yeah. the end of the day even I'm more advanced and I'm pretty confident in my stuff even I still compare sometimes and it's just that I mean because I mean I think imposter syndrome is something that just comes with the artist package you know, you know? Artist, yeah. um, yeah. um but it's like at the end of the day you got and especially when you're really young um, mm -hmm. like, I feel like it was like a blessing in disguise. I didn't go straight into the gaming industry after college because looking at who I was when I left college and who I am now, I don't think I would have survived very well because I just mm -hmm. did not have the mental grit to get in there yet. And, um, not to, and again, when I say these things, it's not to scare anybody, no, of but, course, it's no, just, no, no. <laughs> but it's just a very real situation that you have to consider. Um, you know, cause again, and that goes for any, at the end of the day, any job is a job. And yes. if you, even if things are good, you have to realize you have to show up, you have to do the work. It's not just going to be, you know, like some kind of candy land. <laughs> like if you yeah. love Blizzard, you going in, it's going to be play games about, all day. And yeah. yeah. I mean, work yeah. hard, play hard for sure. But, um, you're, you're on a different side of things. Like you're not on the consumer side anymore. You're on the producing side, which it's a whole different menagerie of mechanics that go on behind the scenes than if you are just someone who's playing the game, you 100%. know? So you have to just really keep that in mind with whatever path you decide to take. Yes, 100%. I agree. Um, so one of the things also that you do in between your fantasy illustration and freelance clients is uh, conventions, um, hmm. which is kind of where I got my start because when <laughs> I left my job um, as an engineer, I was an engineer up, to, up, up until I was 29, 28 years old. I was working as a, an engineer over here in, in Scotland. Okay. Left my job famously, you know, went back to university, retrained, and then I'm here. Um, so yeah, like when I started leaving my job, the, the one thing that I relate to 2D was comic books. And that was the one thing that I wanted to get into was comics. Like, it's a funny story. Like everybody I've always interviewed who's ever done 2D art was like, oh yeah, I wanted to start in comics. Like that was my first thing. And then they, they learn about the hours and like how little they get paid. And they were like, no, fuck that. Like, that's <laughs> even worse than the games industry. So Yeah, oh, it's uh, rough for sure. Yeah. Uh, so I started going to conventions and, and uh, doing fan art. But uh, how have you found like the convention hall? I mean, it's been different the last couple of years, right, with COVID. So it's been... Yeah. It's so this so I went to a, a couple conventions last year, but they were smaller. And like the first one I went to in the summer, it was just a local like kind of pop up one. I actually did pretty well. Um, and so this year, I think is going to be kind of like my my dis definitive year of how things are just mm -hmm. because so before 2020, um, I was selling fan art too at conventions. Mm -hmm. But um, after 2020, my portfolio took a huge shift where basically all I sell is original work now um, and all my fantasy fairy stuff. And I have not had the chance yet to just sell all of that at a big convention. Um, and now with the small one, a lot of stuff did really great. So I know I'm on the right track. So but this year will be kind of like, you know, the trial run of how mm -hmm. my work does, which I'm pretty confident it'll do fine. But like I know I have um, I have a con, which is a big anime convention here in Texas mm -hmm. coming up. Um, and then I got into Dragon Con 
their art oh, show. Congrats. Um, yeah, thanks. <laughs> I got to the, to go in. <laughs> yeah, well, it's actually like the second time I got in because, and the, but this is my first time going because I got in in 2020, but then of course that got wiped off, you know, That's because okay. of obvious reasons. And so, um, my booth got, uh, rolled over to 2021, but because like in the States COVID was still kind of high and I was starting a new teaching job, I was like, I don't feel comfortable traveling just yet. So I had to forego yeah. it. And so, um, this year I'll actually go to their art show and see how it does. Um, but you know, but ultimately like I tell any artist that you, if you're going to start in the industry, really try to get into conventions, even if you're just doing locally, because, um, especially if you're doing your own original stuff, cause that's going to be the most raw information that you're going to get in regards mm -hmm. to how, your art is received by the public. And I, I don't want to say like, it, it's not going to be received by everybody. That's the one thing about selling original work is that you are going to have to find a very niche audience for what you do. But I feel like in the long run, those people are going to be a lot more um, dedicated and to you than, you know, someone who's just going for fan art. And that's kind of like, I'm so sorry. My dog is squeaking her toy. No, it's fine. It's okay. <laughs> so if y'all hear yeah, squeaking, I apologize. No, from home, it's fine when these things happen. Um, no, no, I, I totally feel what you're saying about about uh, conventions and fan art. And I mean, when I started doing fan art, I, was, I mean, the thing, the thing with fan art eventually is that if everybody does it, people will just try and go to the best version of it they'll see in a convention. It's, yep. They're not coming to you because you do fan art. It's just maybe you do a, a particular version of something, but if somebody does it even better, the same character, then you're kind of losing the battle. Um, but then like, yeah, with original stuff, I found that eventually that when I started doing like, uh, landscape paintings for like, mm -hmm. so I tried to do environment art, um, people were like, I oh, really, really, and I got a lot more response to that than like, you know, the Spider-Man stuff I was doing or whatever else. Yeah. Um, and I think that is because when people go to conventions, you know, I think they're looking for unique voices. They're looking for something that they've not seen before because a lot right. of guys will have posters and prints up on their wall, like Harley Quinn and loads of other stuff. And, mm -hmm. you know, it's like, oh, well, it's just more and more stuff the same. But then if you walk past their booth and they see like really original stuff that's done in a style that really appeals to them, then they're like, oh, cool. This is, I want this in my wall, you know? So yeah, yeah but your stuff totally is. Well, and that's the thing. I actually, I encourage anybody. Um, I have a blog post that I wrote recently on fan art in general, so, just yep. because, um, you know, cause and it's so funny. Um, a funny story, like, um, and I know we might get into TikTok in a minute, but like on TikTok, I made, there's, there's two po posts that I made in, re in re relation to this. The first one is I made a post regarding how I increased the, my print say, or my, the cost of my prints over the years. Like when I started at conventions, when I just sold fan art, I, back in 2011, mm -hmm. um, I was selling prints for $15 a piece, but it was fan art, you know, um, a couple years later, I bumped it up to 25 you know, mm -hmm. and it still did fine. And then now today I sell my prints for like $40, $50 a piece. And mm -hmm. on my post, you know, um, about it, like, and great with, when I say the 40 to $50 a piece, that's for my original work. That's no fan art at all. Um, because it's warranted. However, there was a guy who commented on one of my posts saying, Oh, well, what size prints did you get done to sell them at $50 a piece? And I looked at his portfolio and, and nothing against him. And mm -hmm. he had good work, but it was all just fan art pinups. And I just didn't have the heart to tell him to say, you know, even if you, you're not going to sell work, your, your work will not sell at $40 a piece because, you know, you have to realize like art should not be a competition. It's not. But the one instance where it is, is if you are selling fan art at a convention, because you have to look at the mindset, especially at like anime conventions where there's a younger demographic, mm -hmm. um, you got to think of how much people are going to, they're looking for cheap. You know, yeah. especially those teenage kids. So if you're selling a print of Batman for forty dollars, mm. but you know some other artist is selling a print of Batman for twenty down the aisle, who do you yeah. think someone's going to buy? Look, which one are they going to buy? And also, two people are going to question like, why are you selling this for forty dollars when this artist has the exact same thing for twenty? There's no justification for it. Where if you have your own original stuff that's mm -hmm. like unique and no no one else can find it anywhere else, then yeah, it's warranted to be able to make it forty dollars a print. Um, yeah. But, you know, it's... I, but, I mean, it's, I would say that's even, you know, on the cheap side. I mean, I've seen some conventions I've went to in America where, like, you know, it's A3 prints. Well, A3 for us, I can't remember what you guys call it, 11 by 15 or something. But, like, yeah, like, mm -hmm. those ones go for, like, sometimes 80, 90, nearly 100, depending on the artist and, and if you sign it. And, you know, like, even some original illustrations, like, I've seen guys who do, like, physical sketches that are one-offs and, like, yeah, that's, like, 100 bucks or 150. Right. Um, it's it's difficult it's like a whole this is a whole other kind of worms Ash, and you, you know yourself but it's like the race to the bottom you know like people want to constantly undercut everybody and you know undercut for jobs undercut for prints under, you know like yeah it's hard to try and justify like no this is my price and people will be like well 
you know, this guy down the road does it for you. Like, well, that's great for him. It's not me, you know. Yeah. It's like, well, yeah. and it's so funny too, because like I, I've posted about it on TikTok before. I made a post recently about why your portfolio. And when I say this, let me disclaim by this is if you want to work in the industry, like the illustration industry, whether that's book covers, editorials, anything like that. Mm-hmm. You cannot have a lot of fan art in your portfolio. You can't totally. unless it's very, very, very unique. You know, something that's not, and like people will get mad about mm-hmm. it and there's some people like I, I i never worked in comics maybe you can um attest but i know there's another artist named uh oh shoot i can't remember his name off the top of my head but he he got famous for um or he he does work for teen titans now for right. dc but he drew fan art of the teen titans and like some artist was saying that's how he got the job but i was looking at his portfolio and i'm very familiar with his stuff but i'm like he didn't get his kickoff because of Teen Titans. He got his kickoff because of an original comic he made years ago. And right. maybe with comics, it works a little bit differently. But at the end of the day, mm-hmm. I mean, you can draw fan art. That's totally fine, especially if it's something that you enjoy. But you have to be realistic of what art directors look for. Because art directors, even if you draw fan art and you get a job from that fan art, you're probably doing some that those artists are probably doing something that's so unique that a pinup of a fan art character is not going to justify. I um, think... Yeah, I think you've got to be very talented for fan art to correlate to an art director. Like, if, if you're drawing, like, I, I don't know, I'm thinking of some of the guys like Dave Raposa mm-hmm. and stuff who drew the Turtles, for instance, the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, but in such mm-hmm. a way that he done it that, like, was so appealing. Like, people were like, that's a totally new take on how they look, like, that, you know, and that would look cool in a comic. So, obviously, people are like, well, obviously, you're going to get a job then because, mm-hmm. you know, you have that unique spin. But then Dave's stuff was obviously, like, he was a very talented illustrator. So, like, you know those depictations of how he drew the turtles were going to be unique and appealable to an art writer because he's put so much work in foundationally um, to make yep. that look like that. But then I think people have this thing where they can draw bad fan art and get away with it. You know, like if something yeah. like is just almost like a rip off almost sometimes of other people's work or like, you know, they're taking poses from others' pictures and it's, it's, it, I mean, like, we've all been there. Like, I've done it myself, you know, like, I've, I've copied something and said to myself, well, this is fan art, and I can maybe sell this, or this is a fan art, and I can display this, but... Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it, it, it's just a maturity thing, right? I think when people are starting out in the industry, you don't know everything, you don't know how things work, and then you're trying to learn the ways, and even when you do conventions, like, the first year you'll go to a convention, I was the same, you know, you learn certain etiquette about, like, where you put things in your table, or how far you can be from people, or where you can store things, and... Yep. So it's just all mileage. It's, the more you do this stuff, the more you learn yeah the way it's done basically well i think it's also too what's your goal at a convention like there's some people that just draw fan art like i have a friend who i the one of my really close art friends who's he's such a sweet guy and like he just sells fan art but he just goes because he likes the conventions and he wants to make extra money on the side like you know if that's your your calling for conventions that's totally okay you know totally fine you know different strokes for different folks but if you're going to conventions not just to sell but with the goal of also connecting with industry people and getting industry work right. it's a whole different beast and you have to consider those things and um um, you know, again, like I actually just made a course on conventions, like top to bottom. And I talked about this, how, you know, how you carry yourself at conventions, like not just with your art, but with your personality. It's really a big deal when it comes to making sales and actually connecting with art directors. Um, and yeah. even also to the pros and cons of original art, but versus fan art. But at the end of the day, you know, I, I think some artists like think they want a job. Like it, it kind of goes back to the blizzard argument, right? Like some people right. want like a job working at their favorite company because they want to draw batman all day because they love batman but you Mm -hmm. know everything i feel like is it has a season and Mm -hmm. everything at the end of the day it's like you know yes if you're doing something that you love for sure stick with it but eventually that's going to get old too and i think having your own creative voice and coming up with your own ideas and whatnot there's just there's more value in it in the long term just because you know it's it's your baby it's something that you can say i came up with this this is my inspirations it comes from my creative voice no yep. one else can attest to that um and so that's just again you know it just depends on what your goals are whenever you go to these conventions so yeah i think it's also the thing where people think like you're talking about drawing batman and stuff like that you know when i talked to a batman artist at a convention years and years and years ago he was like i mean like you think that's what you're going to draw all day as batman but then you're going to draw you know empty street scenes and cars and perspectives sometimes yep. you're going to draw like an office full of like cops or like gordon instead of batman like you know you're always going to be drawing the cool stuff like you know and it's yeah one of these things where you know people will say like oh why do i have to learn perspective or anatomy or lighting or composition i'm like because then you're telling a story through what you're doing you know people will think ah batman batman batman, batman. Yeah, I, but then you know you need the street behind batman you need the building he's standing on you need, you know you need the shadow and light to really affect you know the mood so that he looks yep. like batman that he's standing in 
you know, like it's things that 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 people don't understand. And then when it comes to drawing fan art, they try to skip to the end, basically, you know, like miss all the essential, you know, fundamental stuff that makes an artist a good artist. And then I think that they can carry the same weight as somebody who's been in the industry for 10 years, who's doing an illustration for big companies. You know, it's like, I get it. Like, you know, kids see it as like a, a thing where like, oh, you know, I can go sell a couple of Batman pieces of fan art or a con and I'll get a job for DC. Like, it's just, you know, it's, it's, it's much more complicated. Well, you have to realize too, it's like, you're not the only person that likes Batman. Batman is yes. loved by millions of people. And it goes Me back too. to like, there's <laughs> always, get, there's, and that's the thing. There's always like to be, um, there's always going to be someone who probably is more skilled than you. And right. I mean, I, I'm a very big believer in the things that are meant to be yours will come, you know, and they come easily. And I see, again, a lot of artists try to force themselves into this Mm -hmm. mold, force themselves to get these interviews. And it does, they put these expectations on themselves and it doesn't happen and they get disappointed. And I'm like, you have to realize it's like, you know, it's, it's much more competitive than what you realize. And that's why standing out and being unique is so important. So important when it comes to trying to work in the Again, the, the, the fundamentals, the experience, it's all stuff you need because, I mean, I'm in, I remember way back when uh, somebody was talking to, you know, a, a, an art director on a comic book series. And I mean, I know that I'll mention the actual series, but it was quite a big series at the time. But one of the, the, the kids at the time who was talking to him was saying, you know, oh, you know, it takes me about, I don't know, like, you know, about two weeks to do uh, one illustration. And what's the kind of turnaround on comics? And they were like, oh, we probably look for about 30, 35 pages within a week. And he was like, Oh, okay, right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I didn't think it was that quick and like that. He said, well, that's just rough pencils. And then even then he's still like, fucking hell, like still that one, like 35 pages. Um, but like, yeah, it, it's it's the ability to to take on that workload. And I think that comes with experience and time. But yeah, with conventions, I think um you have to go into that for the right reasons. I would even say if you're going to a convention to look for work, don't go and get a table. I would say just build a portfolio and then go and talk to people. Um, and yeah. you don't have to have a, a, a table to really sell your work. I mean, there's plenty, even a lot of the New York Comic Cons and stuff, they have, DC and Marvel have lists now that you can apply for, I think, before you go there and they'll do like feedback or reviews. They used to do it mm-hmm. years ago, but I don't know if they still do it. But yeah. yeah, that's probably a better thing to sign up for than going to get like listed to have a, a table. Um, yeah. Just take your work and show it to people. Well, and that's the big thing is talking to people. Like even me, like um, our big convention here in Texas is Fan Expo. Fan Expo has con- conventions all over the country. But, um, right. you know, I mean, some of my best like industry connections I've met through Fan Expo. I've met Scott Harbin, who does work for Star Wars. Um, one of my friends. And here's the other funny thing, too, about conventions. You never know the connections that you make where they'll lead. Like, for example, I have a friend named Adam Nasralla. And mm-hmm. when I met him, it was actually Scott Harbin that introduced me to him. I was a student, like, just about to graduate college. And I told him what I was doing. And he's like, I, at the time, I wanted to work in, like, animation. Mm-hmm. And he was like, oh, go. There's Adam over there. He's around your age. Like, go talk to him. And so I just went up to Adam and I said, like, hey, Scott sent me over here. This is what I do. And we were chatting and we became friends. And now today, you know, we're still acquaintances. And he is a producer at Cyanide and Happiness, you know. Oh, so, nice. Yeah. And it's like you – and at the time that wasn't the case. And so – but it all comes down to, like, you have to put yourself out there and be respectful mm-hmm. and make those connections because, like and, – and especially, too, whether you're at a booth or not, like, don't – Like I always say, like you have to have good artist alley etiquette because you never know who you're going to talk to and never burn a bridge because that could be an opportunity down the line or a really cool connection. Um, Yeah, for sure. So um, I think as long as you go into those conversations, not looking to just like fish them for work. Like if you genuinely like talk to them like a person and try and build an actual relationship with them and a friendship, then that will be more organically able to produce a connection of like, oh, you know, there's a job coming up and I thought I'd recommend you, blah, blah, blah. Like if you yep. just sit and talk to me like, oh, did you get my job? Can you get my job? Like people like, like I'm not just going to sit and talk to you because you want to get work. Like how boring yeah. is that? Um, and they, it's, it's, it's one of these things I've seen. I've, it sounds stupid, but I've seen kids do that. Like walk up to, you know, people who work for DC and, and are be like, oh yeah, like how did I get a job? How did I get a job? And they're like, wow, like, you know, there's a million, you know, YouTube videos and Google forums you could go and look on and, you don't have to ask me, like, you know, um, but guys I've met, like like you said, when I went to Artist Alley's, I've, I've met them and then, you know, some of them are now writing comics and and uh, and doing stuff for, like, major studios or some of them went actually working into games and now they're working for big AAA, you know, developers and stuff. So, yeah, it's one of these things where you never know where a, a friendship will start and where people will end up. But, yeah, you have to go in for, for the right reasons. You don't have to try not to be fake, I think, is the idea that, you know, you're, you're only talking to people for 
because you want one thing off them. You know what I mean? Right. And like, that's what, like, I usually tell artists, like, usually, like, the, I'm sure there's a couple menagerie of things, but I always tell most artists that there's the top three things that art directors look for when they're hiring someone. They're, mm -hmm. The first one is obviously, you know, skill. They want to know that you can do the job. The second mm -hmm. thing is that they want to know that your work is a fit for the job, you know, so it's not just about having good skill. Does it work for the project? And then the third one I feel like is the most important thing overall is they want to know that you're easy to work with, which what that means mm -hmm. is not, not being, not being a pushover, but knowing that you are personable, you have a good personality, you are, you make everybody's lives easier when it comes you're to not working. A deck. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And if you're, it's like what you were saying, if you're just going in, like, give me work, it's like, what yeah. does that say automatically off the bat? And like, that's like, I've told some artists, you know, actually one of the most effective ways that I've gotten jobs and actually some of the opportunities that happen to me right now, I actually cold email people, but I don't go in saying, give me a job. Like the way right. I lead in with my emails is like, I say, Hey, I'm Ashley. This is what I do. Like, you know, I'm a fan of y'all's work. I'm just kind of looking around. I would love to connect. I don't mm -hmm. say I'm looking for a job, but I would love to connect if there's opportunities. Thank you for your time. And yes. that's like, and that if you do it in a really warm, effective way, like, yes, you're kind of asking about opportunities, but you're not going in with an entitled attitude, you yes. know? And cause that the other thing is too, is like, yes, you don't want to just ask for work, but at the same time, like advocating for yourself in a good, healthy way does actually say a lot and can be very effective. But I, yes. I agree with you too, though, where like, if you have a good relationship with somebody, it goes mm. back to that point of like, you know, that person who's referring to you, they know that you'll make the project easy to work with, you know, like you'll, you are easygoing and you, you, you can be trusted, you yes. know, and that's a huge, huge deal. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, like I, we, we could be in it all day, but I mean, I think it just <laughs> simply just comes down to just being a genuinely nice person. I think yep. the easier somebody can see that you can have a conversation with them or they put you at ease, then yeah, it's, it's more easy for them to see, well, oh, well, I would want to work with this person. I mean, again, just recently I had an interview with um, an art director and he was saying that like, yeah, like some people I've taken on that maybe wouldn't have really super hard skills where, you know, they're really, really talented, but then... I know they're a great person to work with and I know they're really passionate. So like, you know, I would take a risk on them just to, the fact that I could probably level them up art wise because I can help work with them. Yeah. Um, but then you can't take somebody in who is difficult to work with or just difficult in general and then teach them that set. You know, they could be a great artist, but then if they're difficult to work with or they can't work within a team structure, yep. then yeah, you're kind of, you're fighting a losing battle. So um, yeah, anyway. But so yeah, so I mean, conventions is another thing. Obviously, you're doing the, the back of your illustrations. You're out selling your work and making an name for yourself. Um, but also now, social media is playing a, whole, a huge part in that because we've got your blog. Obviously, we talked about that. Um, but now, obviously, TikTok and then you're doing them kind of regularly. Is that something that just came at like a spur of a moment? Was it like something just because you had the app and you thought I'll start doing stuff or? So it was so TikTok was a very random jump in. So I, I started TikTok back in I think it was June or July of last year. And the reason why I made this I didn't I don't want to say I made the switch. I just wanted to try something new was Instagram mm. lately has been difficult for me just because I yes, think ev right. I think everybody is fighting the algorithm and I think partially Instagram and Facebook are like the worst things ever. They're getting worse every day. It's yeah. awful because they're trying so hard to compete with TikTok, but like I just wasn't having as much growth on Instagram, but I still keep it because it's definitely got value there however mm -hmm. i was like you know what instagram is just being a butt let me try mm -hmm. <laughs> let me try tiktok and when i started with tiktok you know i my goal in there was just to kind of like go in share mm -hmm. my art um whatnot and like i mean my first tiktok that i posted i mean it wasn't like viral viral but like it was just me like erasing away a layer and showing off my one of my pieces yeah. yeah yeah and it like got like nine thousand views within like a day and i was like holy holy crap like it just yeah. actually worked out and so but then from there this is where it all began to change though <laughs> so yeah, yeah. for people that know don't know me in person or like you know they i'm a very goofy person in real life um mm -hmm. and i just love a good laugh and so one of the things i started doing on tiktok was i just basically started doing kind of like artist like prop memes like artist right. problems, you know, like I think I did one where one of the ones that went viral, I did the whole thing where like, you know, when artists say they draw expressions, they like make the face too. I mm. made, I made a, a silly one paired with music like that. And it got like, I want to say like a hundred thousand views or something oh, wow. like that. And, and those ones, like it was through a lot of videos like that, that I grew my following. 
Mm-hmm. And I really actually just love to enjoy it because I, I will say this TikTok, I don't think is the best, always the best conversion for sales. It can be, but it's great for raising awareness. So yes. when I, with TikTok, like, you know, I think I was able to kind of connect with artists on a much more personal level because there's, when you post on Instagram for the most part, like you, they're seeing your art, you know, they're seeing a picture mm-hmm. on a screen and you can share in the caption, you know, mm-hmm. um, about what it's all about. But TikTok gave me an, a way to express myself in a much more personable way where people weren't just seeing my work, they were seeing my personality. And also with me doing these art memes of think of like art struggles that artists go through, whether that's, you know, when someone asks to, um, <clears throat> to pay an exposure or, you know, art block, they, like it just helped right. me to connect with an audience much more deeper. And that's really important, I think, for artists is I see a lot of young artists, they think that they're just going to post their work online, not show their face, not say much, and they'll, they're going to get a following. But it yeah. kind of goes back to what we were just talking to. It's like people want to know your personality. I mean, unless you're Banksy and you can get away <laughs> with <laughs> not showing your face, like great. Yeah. But like for the most part, most artists have to you know, have something for their audience to connect to. And TikTok was definitely something that I, I just enjoy it like casually to just kind of relate to people. And I've made some really cool art friends through TikTok too. Like um like I made friends with um a couple book cover artists like Katie Ritchie and another guy named Jeff Brown Graphics. You know, I'm mm. on their Discord now and we talk mm. and you know it's just so organic and warm and like I just it's just a lot of fun. So like yeah. I encourage artists to try it out. For sure. It was one, it was, I'm trying to remember if it was specifically you, but I'm trying to remember, wasn't there a TikTok you done and it was all about you changing the nibs on your Wacom pens? Yeah. Oh my God. I have a funny story about that one. So there is that whole meme going around where this guy did the, he would like, like the, 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 the Voldemort thing from Harry yeah. Potter. And so I did that with my Wacom nib. And so mm. I took it out and I, I did the trend and I posted the video and it went viral. Well, afterwards, mm. though, someone commented say, saying like, you know, oh, yeah, there's more nibs in your Wacom holder. I yeah. never knew that. Oh, really? At all. I never <laughs> knew. And so I yeah. filmed myself taking my little holder, opening it up. And it's just me going like, oh, my God, <gasps> like discovering yeah. this. And it's it like went, six other ones or something. In there. It got 303,000 views. Me yeah. just being a freaking idiot. And here's the funny thing out of that. I got so many comments of people mm-hmm. saying like, well, why didn't you read the manual? I'm like, no one freaking <laughs> reads the manual. I'm like, I've had this backup tablet for eight yeah, yeah. years. And I just like, and but it's, a, it's a, but I like learned to laugh at stuff like that. And I even did a follow-up TikTok. Like, you know, mm-hmm. when you go, like, cause my thing was like, okay, like I'm gonna use TikTok to share my art and share like art tips and business stuff and then i go viral for freaking not knowing where my wacom nibs are i'm like I know. It's <laughs> stupid but it's the weirdest a good thing laugh. i know but then it's one of these things with viral right you can't plan that you can't you know make a thing where i want this one to go viral or i want this one to go viral it's, it's, yeah uh, that's i mean i'm tiktok actually i know a couple of people who have used it for advertising and uh they're saying it's one of the few social media platforms that you, they've used where they've paid for exposure so they're so they now have a thing with tiktok where you can promote stuff for money so if you want yeah. to like, promote a specific post and stuff but they've spent you know like maybe they've decided like i'll oh, we'll spend i don't know 50 bucks and see if it goes anywhere but they've got like you know like five hundred thousand, a million views or like you know so many comments so many likes you can actually when you click on something you could choose what you want to have like more exposure views or mm-hmm. followers um and they were like yeah like it actually works whereas like uh instagram and facebook like it's such a paywall and then even then you know like you said the conversion is so small like are people actually going to buy your stuff but with tiktok they've actually seen that the paid exposure is actually helping their business grow and i think it's one of these things where i, I don't know how facebook and instagram are going to keep up with them because i think more and more every day people are converting to tiktok I think, well, and even Instagram now, I don't know if you saw, they, so one of the things that I was doing was like, you know, Instagram has their reels and that's kind of like mm. where their algorithm is leaning towards right now. Mm. However, um, like what I was doing, a lot of uh, other people were doing was they were taking their TikToks and reposting them to Instagram. Reels. However, you know, Instagram just came out maybe about a week, two weeks ago saying that they are changing their algorithm where they're going to punish our people that mm. basically do that because they want them to use their their own platform instead of reposting TikToks all the time, mm. which I mean, I get on one hand where like someone, if they're reposting TikToks that aren't even theirs, yeah, I yeah, could yeah. get that. However, for someone like me, that's like just recycling my own content. I yeah. feel like, you know, Instagram is shooting themselves in the foot because mm-hmm. they, you, they're not, 
they're not acknowledging the flow of like how people work. And also too, it's already hard enough for artists on Instagram. I feel like, you know, like it's like the, the people that the people that get a lot of followers on Instagram are usually like models or whatever and whatnot. But, um, but again, I don't want to knock either TikTok or Instagram because TikTok is like, like t- TikTok's mon- monetization actually I've heard is not that great either. Um, right. But, um, you know, at the end of the day, this is kind of the mindset that I have when it comes to social media is that yeah. social media is your tool yes. and you need to like, and so there's, there's a common conversion rate that a lot of people use that I use it as well is like, you know, the first thing you want to do to get followers is awareness, right? You want to make yourself known. So mm-hmm. once you, which TikTok is great for that you know, Mm -hmm. to start, then from there, you need to take those followers and you need to nurture them somehow. So Instagram is more of a nurturing platform where you can like, you know, do longer posts, you know, you know, share your work, um, make kind of do warm leads through DMS or whatever. Mm -hmm. And you, and it can't, doesn't have to just be Instagram. It could be a YouTube channel. It could be a podcast, you know, um, stuff like that. And then from there, you got to convert those people to trust you, you know, because, and when they, cause when they trust you, then they're mm. going to buy from you. And so like, I mean, yeah, sometimes there's some people that just off the bat buy my art, but when it comes to things like my course, mm. um, you know, I have to like, you know, show people, you know, okay, this is what this is about. Like, cause I mean, like, for example, my convention course is $200. It's like, mm. you know, I, it's to find the people that are serious about actually wanting to invest in their growth, but they're not going to spend money, that kind of money, unless they trust you first. And so um, it's just kind of like understanding that kind of rhetoric when it comes to using social media and separating yourself too from comparison and just and like, you know, using it in a constructive way, understand the SEOs and algorithms and stuff like that, but don't put so much weight into social media. If you're putting out good content, eventually it's going to come. It's good. One day something's going to blow up. And that's yeah. the thing with TikTok is everybody tries to go viral. And I'm like, that's not, if you're just using TikTok just to go viral, you're never going to go viral. You have yeah, to just 100%. keep posting and just yeah. grow your following and, you know, see what happens from there. Or get to a point where you're a big enough artist that when you draw a social media account somewhere, people will just automatically follow you. Like right. um, one of my buddies, Paul here in Edinburgh, like has been a, a concept artist and an art director for a while. And when he opened his Twitch, you know, because he had obviously that legacy of the whole 10 years of, of you know, painting and drawing and, and being a, uh, a really amazing artist when the twitch opened people were like just flooding to his twitch to watch him paint because you know they had a, a kind of following so it's one of these things where you know initially as an artist i think instagram and facebook and tiktok can be great things to help just you know keep you going you know, rolling along the building a small following but then ultimately your work is something that's going to define you and make you different you know when people come to you they want to say well what makes this person different why should i follow them um and if you're an artist especially that's definitely a niche that is you know, because there's a, the whole hashtag art talk, right? There's a whole section of TikTok that's just artists. Um, and I think that if you really lean on that, sometimes like you'll definitely find maybe like not a huge following, but maybe like a very small dedicated following. Um, and that's definitely always better, I think, than um, like I only have like, you know, 3000 subscribers on YouTube, but like, you know, it's a more dedicated, small niche group that I know appreciates the work I do and you know really enjoys the content I put out um I don't think I'd want like you know 1.6 and a half million you know followers <laughs> like I don't know right. what I, I don't I don't know I, I wouldn't know what to do with them so yeah yeah it's one of these things where you've definitely got to measure expectations and what you want well so, and, it, yeah. and it also comes too because I think again another case of rose-colored glasses like there's a lot of artists out there that equate success or monetary success with how many followers you have on Instagram or whatever. And that is not the case at all. Cause like, I know of people that have like, you know, they may have like hundreds of thousands of followers, but their conversion rate sucks because they're just focused on just getting anybody to look at their page. And that's why like I tout about the whole, you know, like the whole working for exposure thing is bull crap because like, yeah, you, someone may expose your work to their hundred thousand follow hundred thousand following but how many of those people are truly dedicated to what you do the people that buy from you are the dedicated followers and i mean sometimes you know again there's artists out there that have like 1500 followers and it's enough you know as long as like you're able to get like you know a good amount of money from them or be able to help them and they're dedicated it's like stop worrying about the numbers worry about your content and what you're putting out and how you're growing that organically because if you're worrying about yeah if you're yeah. worrying about the number of followers, you're just, and also too, people don't realize too, like people buy followers, guys, like they, yeah. they, they, they cheat. So don't yeah. like, you got to like disconnect that and just do again, off, authentically show up, do your thing, grow yeah. those people. And also too, when you, it's social media, it's called social media because it's supposed to be social. Like also don't just post on Instagram and just be like, okay, I'm done. Like 
comment on every post. Like actually one recently, it's it, some people don't realize this. I actually had a job interview last year with an art director and you know, we were talking about my work and of course he found my Instagram and he goes, mm. he goes, you know, what's really interesting about your Instagram. And I was like, what? And he goes, you commented back to almost every single comment on your posts. And that was the last thing I expected him to say. He was like, the thing I saw from that is that you didn't, you tried to, you made people you acknowledge them. And that's a huge deal. And people don't realize too, is like, you have to like comment back message. Cause that's what social media platforms reward. They don't reward just good content. They reward engagement. And that's both on the, the end of people that are engaging with you and how you engage with them. So if you're posting on Instagram and doing nothing and expecting to get hundreds of thousands of likes, that's not how it's going to work. Like I always tell people within the first hour of you posting any comments, you get respond to them even if it's just some emojis, because that is going to bump you up in the algorithm and that's going to reward you in the uh, yeah. platform's favor. In the I mean, term. like even engagement, Facebook is a nightmare just now as well, because, you know, unless you're really actively on it, you know, it won't reward you by, you know, bring empty your post. I have like 3000 plus friends on Facebook and nearly all of them are industry people. And if I post something, you know, you're lucky if five people see it, but it's because, I never use Facebook. Like I'm never commenting other people's posts. I'm not liking them. I'm not engaging. I mean, to be, I don't want to like, but then yeah. you know, because, because at the moment, Facebook is just a tool for meeting people like yourself and getting people on the podcast. That's really why I use it. Right. Um, but like, yeah, outside of that, I, I don't know what the future holds. It's going to be a really difficult and, you know, hard one, I think, especially for artists. There's a whole debate right now where people are like, you know, they've been in the industry for 10 plus years and they're saying themselves, well, I have the skills now maybe a bit of financial capital could i make a, a platform where people could have a social media for artists like how would that work which is weird because like we kind of have that in a sense way art station and stuff like deviant art where right there's a form to post your work but also for people to feed back and comment and get involved so yeah I, I don't know what the i mean i don't know i'm not clever enough to tell you a solution what it would be but then yeah i don't know how that you know how long term these things like tiktok and stuff are are going to be for us because um, well, even yeah. TikTok, it's like I don't know how social you can be in TikTok. Um, you can you can be pretty social because I com the cool thing about TikTok is not only can you comment like I do video you can do the video comments right like so like when someone right. like you know if someone like asks me a question about something that I already talked about I can follow up with more content that's the cool thing about TikTok is that it's kind of self building depending how you use it and um you know it's just like and it's just more much more accessible um but the only thing I will say about TikTok is that you just got to be aware of the platform because it is mostly a younger demographic. Um, right. So you have to keep things bite sized for the most part. Like TikTok recently released 10 minute videos. Um, mm. And I don't know how well those will go over unless you have something right. that's really, really engaging. engaging. Most people, like, I mean, especially younger audiences, they have the attention span of a squirrel. <laughs> Yeah. You know, it's like you got to, you know, have something that's very impactful within mm -hmm. like 10 seconds or less. And th those are the things that usually would go viral it's, for me. It's um, the meme culture really it is like that's how TikTok really, I think, got initially was like dance videos, memes, like it was all that kind of stuff that was short yeah. form and funny and engaging. And it kind of has actually almost jumped off the back of Vine, you know, where yep. like the three second videos where people thought to themselves that's or six second videos, sorry, but the people were saying, oh yeah and it's never going to take off and it's too short and everything but then that platform existed for a good couple of years where people were like flooding to it in masses and you know it died eventually because they didn't take care of their creators but like at the same time i think it started to pave a path for what is now tiktok um, yeah yeah so, well, and also, then, well, and also, well, also th the thing too, I tell artists too, though, is mm -hmm. like you say, like, how long are these platforms going to last? Like, um, mm -hmm. I, I tell artists, you know, young artists, like, make sure you have a website because I mean, yeah, I've heard of people that get jobs through, in, through Instagram and whatnot. However, mm -hmm. I, I always use the example. I'm like, what if it, what if Instagram and Facebook or whatever didn't exist and people look yep. at me incredulously and I'm like, do y'all not remember like six months ago when Instagram and Facebook were down the entire day, you know, yeah. because of a server error, I'm like, it's not impossible. I mean, yeah, it's like, it's probably very unlikely in the next mm. couple of years, but you have to just be aware. It's like, you know, you got to be aware of your platforms, use them as tools. Don't use them as your main, you know, portfolios or whatnot. So that yeah. way you, again, you want to lead and nurture that audience to your website, to whatever your platform, your, your portfolio. So then from there, then people are buying your prints, asking you for work, all of that stuff. So, um, you know, 
Yeah, I, I mean, it's one of these things that I was talking about. I, might, I can't remember the subject matter specifically, but we were talking about how long ago somebody posted work. I think we were looking at a website, no website, sorry, somebody's working art station, and they were like, oh, well, you know, the, the earliest thing they posted was only six years ago. And I was like, yeah, but remember, art station wasn't a thing before 2014. Like, you know, it only existed, you know, back when somebody invented it. I mean, before then, what was their deviant art and something else? But CG yeah. forms and, you know, or conceptart.org or whatever it was. But mm-hmm. yeah, the, the industry and, and websites that will constantly evolve. You've always got to have a backup year work somewhere. And websites, I find, are difficult sometimes because unless you've got real good SEO that's driving people there, or of course links, you know, I think one of the best tools I've used the last couple of years is Linktree, um, yep. where you can just basically just put all your links in one thing and th- fire it up into a, a URL. Mm-hmm. Um, so that keeps everything kind of handy. But yeah, like it, websites are kind of hit or miss. I think it depends on what your end game is with work. Um, I definitely think if you're working in the entertainment industry, ArtStation is one of the best for visibility. I know art directors that scan that constantly for work and, and hiring people. Um, DeviantArt, to an extent yeah still but then unless you're pointing people towards it i don't think they would go and look for it specifically so yeah it's like there's no one thing that's like you know yeah everything so yeah you've got to try and put your your hands out into different uh, windows and wave as much as you can to well, and, and i think the other thing too is also the most i think the most effective one is in physically in person like not just conventions like oh, yeah. conventions are the number one for me however also workshops you know, like the workshops are a huge deal. I met so many industry people at workshops. I'm actually going to be at, um, I don't know if you know who Jeff Miracola is. Um, I'll be, he works for Magic the Gathering, but um, along with Howard Leon and a couple of them, I'm gonna, they're hosting a workshop in, um, in June that I'll be guesting at. And like, you know, there's people there like Tom Jencott, who's an art director at, um, at Wizards. Um, mm-hmm. uh, what's his name? Uh, Kikai Kotaki, I think his name is. He's worked on Guild Wars, like Guild Wars. Like there's those kinds of places where, you know, you have to go and if you show up and say, hey, this is me, here's my card. Like, you know, that's going to be the most impactful. Yeah, that takes a lot more work. But I always tell people like, if you have an opportunity to show up in person, do it, you know, learn how to be respectful and communicate. But it's just a combination of that with the social media. But you can't just be, you can't at the end of the day, just be in a cave and hope to get work. You no, know. that was the, that was the first five years of my life was going to events around the world like Trojan Horse was a unicorn THU, you um playgrounds industry workshops um loads of other, like obviously Lightbox in 2018 in LA like the Bobby Chu set up like yeah I've tried to go to everything and meet everybody and that's how I have met people like you know um you know meeting people at events as the whole reason I basically have a podcast you know when I went to the industry workshops back in 2016 um the first people that I met at that event were my first guests on the podcast like mm-hmm. Marek Maggi and Martin Kliski like the guys from CD Project Red who were working on The Witcher at the time and had just finished and um Borkut Eriksson who was up at CCP working on Star Citizen like you know there's there's, there's loads of people who were working on all these amazing games that I got to meet at these events and I was just like hey I'm Gordon like I'm I, I do a, you know I'm a student at the time I was like, I'm a student and I do a podcast I'd love for you to come on and talk about your work and they were like yeah sure man hit me up on Facebook and we can talk and um but then I'm very extroverted in a sense that I can talk for days and talk at length so when you're in that kind of world as an artist when it's fully kind of introverts they kind of um respond to extroverts a bit more sharply like they they don't get it very often so when you start talking to them they're like all right cool yeah if you want to talk and um it was the same you know i've I've said this fucking story a million times but you know when i when i walked up to raf grazetti and and teach you in motla like you know i just was like hey man like i'm a big fan of your work you know i love to pick your brain about character art one point and you know, and he was like, all right, cool. And then that led to me working with him at one point in his catch art course. Like, so, you know, um, yeah, half of it is just turning up and talking to people 100%. Well, and again, too, it's like, I think artists are scared to approach mm-hmm. other artists sometimes. Because I think, especially when it comes to online, because especially if you're a younger artist, because I was in this place too, you, 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 it's like kind of what we were talking about earlier, right? Like they're your heroes, you know, and like you, you see them through this lens Mm -hmm. of like, you know, oh, they're better than me. You're putting them on a pedestal. But at the end of the day, I mean, mean, most artists that I have met that Mm -hmm. in person, they're just, they're down to earth people. Like they were in the same place. And that's like with me, 
you know, I'm whenever people come up to my booth, like I mean, Grant, I only have so much time at conventions. I can't do a portfolio review, but no, you know, no, when 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 people ask me about stuff or come up to my booth, or even if it's online, they ask me questions. I'm an open book. I'm like, there's no secret because, like I was saying earlier, it's not a competition. It's like we're all in this together. We're all just trying to make a living, creating cool crap. <laughs> and it's like you know, but you have to take that first step and be approachable. And like, that's what, especially if like, like right now I'm teaching a, a, a class of high schoolers in a, in an animation class. And some of them have such great talent, but they, but they haven't said a word all year long. And I'm like, mm. Oh, these kids are going to struggle. I'm like, you know, yeah. you're only as effective as you can communicate. Like you can have a great skill set, but if you, if your communication skills are not good, it's yeah. everything else is shot. So I recommend to introvert because I was an introvert. I, I mean, I still kind yeah, of yeah. am, even though it doesn't <laughs> seem like it. Um, but I had to learn how to just lean into like my truth, how I talk. Like I always recommend to people the YouTube website Charisma on Command because it's a mm. great, we- great channel to kind of help you break out of your shell and teach you how to like talk in situations and stuff, which sounds so silly. But yeah, yeah. at the end of the day, it's like learn how to communicate and don't be afraid to approach people because yeah, nobody yeah. can do this alone. Nobody can. No. 100% like people have approached at events like you know I've, I've, I've sometimes the weird thing about events sometimes is that you can sit next to somebody who's a 20 year veteran and then you'll talk to them about random stuff and then they'll be like oh yeah I work at Riot or I work at Blizzard and you're like oh holy shit like I never knew yeah. you know <laughs> don't know who they were but um but even woke up and talking to Raf people were like I can't believe you went and talked to him like what did you say I was like I just told him I was a fan of his work like and the same at teach you when I went to talk to Carla Ortiz you know like Carla's an amazing artist lots of people love her I was just like, oh, can I have your autograph? Like, I really love your work. Oh, sure, man, sure. And like, you know, signing in, like, ah, oh, that's awesome. You enjoying yourself? Yeah, cool. Like, you know, like she was just fun. I mean, she was drunk, but like she was, she was just fun <laughs> to talk to. Um, but then like since then, obviously she's been in the podcast and we've talked off, you know, off camera and we've talked on Facebook and stuff. And she's just a blast. She's just an awesome person to talk to. I mean, we've talked about like Final Fantasy and like old school, like RP, you know, Japanese RPGs and stuff. And um, yeah, like they're just people like us. Like, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a thing where, like you said you put people on a pedestal but like yeah they're just they're just us they're just you know i think yeah. because they have high echelons in our industry they seem impressive but then of course in any other industry or people that want it us who are artists they would just be normal people anyway so yeah i think i think also people respect and respond to that if you treat them like human beings and treat them like normal people they kind of enjoy that because i think when people get treated like kind of like the god status constantly they kind of just yeah. Either get a complex or they just get fed up with it. So well, you know. and the thing I always try to tell myself, I mean, like you know, I mean, my my name's not high on the totem pole either, but like you know, at the end of the day, it's like whenever, like, and I, even just on TikTok, like I when people respond to me and say like your stuff is so helpful, like you know, mm-hmm. you're and I'm not trying to brag at all. I, I'm not no, no, like no. people like say like you know like you're just such an inspiration to me. I'm so like yeah, yeah. that gives me drive. That's the thing that like makes my job worth it at the end of the day we're like yes i love to create and share my work with the world but that's also my teacher side where i'm like knowing that i'm helping someone else with their art journey and knowing that like i'm helping them grow and get letting them walk away with something more that Mm -hmm. makes me have a warm fuzzy because at the end of the day as artists like i think it's Mm -hmm. like i think of like you know old master artists where you know we look at their work today and we put them on a pedestal but like you know they're dead and gone and like everybody's like Mm -hmm. oh you're famous once you're dead you know um but you know today we have that impact a little bit more strongly because we have such more avenues of being social and so like it's a legacy that we leave behind like not just our work like Michelangelo or Van Gogh but like you know when we walk away from our work it's like okay who are we the person that the community knew us as because now it's not it's not a matter of just us sitting in a studio putting our work up for art critics to look at it's like we are showing up on social media we're showing up mm-hmm. in workspaces talking to other people and you know mm-hmm. how do you want people to think of you at the end of the day and it's you know are you remembered as a good person who helped people or are you just you know i mean most art most artists are not but every once in a while i meet some kind of asshole you know, yeah. but, you know but you know it's but they're one they're one it's the ratio is very small and so yeah, cool. always just remember we're all people like we said earlier be kind and like and authentic and it it, it will take you a long way it really yes. really will 100 percent. and i can't think of any better note to end on than that ashley i think yeah. that's probably just said it all so <laughs> hey well, yeah, I mean, uh, I won't take up too much of your time, but like, yeah, it was a great talk. Um, I really enjoyed the conversation we had. I think you're a great inspiration to like see the like artists, and I think you're going to do great things in the next couple of years. So, Thank yeah, I you. hope you enjoyed the talk. Yeah. I did. I love talking. Awesome. I haven't talked to. I, I, I've been. Kind of, I, I say that like talk to people, but like in the last couple of months, I've been like holed up in my my yeah, office your host, yeah, working yeah. on stuff. You know. Yeah. <laughs> 
They're like, oh my god, people, it. people. Yeah, yeah, yes. yeah. Cool. <laughs> Um, yeah, yeah, so I mean, that was awesome. Um, yeah, uh, if you guys have been listening obviously to this point, thanks very much again for, for staying uh, to this point and, and listening to us. Um, I hope you enjoyed it. Um, if you have any comments or feedback, again, you can leave that down below in the comment section. You can leave us any likes or dislikes up to you guys. Just any feedback is great. Uh, and again, we have a Discord, so if you guys want to join in and jump in there and, and give any critiques or feedback or post your own stuff, um, you're more than welcome. And uh, yeah, that's, that's pretty much it. Um, yeah, uh, hope you're staying safe. Hope you're enjoying what you're doing. Thanks again for listening. Thanks again to Ashley for coming on. And uh, yeah, we'll see you guys in the next episode. Thanks, guys. Bye. Bye.